All right, so for the most part, that concludes the primer on using Zotero. I think that it'll go a long way to helping you both in this class and in your academic career. Next up, I want to talk, give you guys some tips and techniques that you can use to conduct good, honest research. So one thing that I've noticed in the classes that I've taught and by looking at your drafts for your informative speeches is there seems to be quite a bit of confusion about what actually or makes a good source. So I think that it would be useful if I went over that just a bit. If you look over here on the screen, you'll notice that I've created a color-coded continua of sources. For the most part, when conducting research for a speech or for a paper, it's in your best interest to try to stick to the sources um, imaged up at the top. Typically, things like peer-reviewed journals, books written by subject experts, and government statistics are going to be of the higher quality type sources that will help better establish your credibility. Now, sometimes you can't find the information that you really need to make a point from those sources, then it's okay for contextual reasons or simply to try to establish partial uh, credibility to go and pull in some of the stuff that I have in the yellow category. So, Things like third-party private research sites are pretty good. Um, choosing news articles from the top-tier news sources like AP and a, um, AFA, that's also pretty good too. Even things like uh, New York Times and CNN would be all right. And then perhaps some first-person accounts that directly relate to whatever phenomena you're talking about. After that, things start to get a little bit muddled. Typically, I recommend that students avoid sources that come from activist organizations or political websites. Uh, something that can be a little confusing is in the past I've had students try to cite whitehouse.gov. I mean, it's the White House. It seems like a pretty credible site. Unfortunately, whitehouse.gov has become somewhat of a politically biased site. Um, under the last couple White Houses. So typically best to stick to the websites of major government organizations and look at things like census data. Uh, after that, you have the set of sites that you really don't want to do, want to use at all. And those are websites like John's Amazing Immigration Extravaganda website or pretty much any site that doesn't fall into the list of citations pictured above. Then also things that I've had pop up in class is trying to cite your dad, your roommate, your cat, your friend. Anything like that is not appropriate for an academic speech or an academic paper and should be avoided for my sanity and the sake of your grade. All right, so I'm going to take you through now the process that I have found useful both when I was a debater doing academic research for debate and when researching a new topic. So the first thing I want to talk to you about is my first step, using Wikipedia. Now, throughout the university, you're going to probably find a lot of varying opinions on the use of Wikipedia. And given sometimes on Wikipedia, things aren't right. However, recent research which I should have a source, but I don't, but has shown that the information found on Wikipedia is at least as accurate, or perhaps better say, equally inaccurate to that found in any other encyclopedia. Generally, when doing academic research, you never, ever, ever want to cite any encyclopedia, Wikipedia included. So ultimately, my opinion on Wikipedia uh, echoes what Dr. Justice brought up in his research lecture. It's a great place to start, really, really bad place to finish. But I want to talk to you guys a little bit about how to use it effectively. So when I'm researching a topic that I've never really researched before, or I don't really know a whole lot about, I'll often navigate to the Wikipedia entry on that phenomenon. So the case example that I'm using here today relates to the theme of this public speaking class, which is crossing borders, and so I chose to bring up the Wikipedia entry on illegal immigration to the United States. 
Now, if I was doing research on this topic, the first thing that I would do would be to read this Wikipedia enter entry from top to bottom. Most Wikipedia entries have a page cut off at about five, six pages, so it's not that much to read, and it gives you a really good subject overview on whatever you're looking at. So go ahead and read that article. And then the next step in finding good sources is you notice as you move through a Wikipedia entry, you always run into uh, these little hyperlinks right here that have a pair of brackets with a number. When you see a pair of brackets and a number like that, that means that it's relating to a source or a citation. Uh, particularly things like this, a paper in the peer-reviewed tax lawyer, anything like peer-reviewed scholarly journal, good keywords to know that they might be good sources. If you click on that hyperlink, it'll bounce you down to the bottom of the entry where there's often a references section for the given Wikipedia entry. In this case, I found a link to a scholarly um, article, um, or excuse me, a law review that might be useful to bring into my paper. This takes us on to the next step. We want to find those good references and citations. Now, just to before we move on, there are other ways to find good references. You may be reading a book or an article where they reference another source. From this point on, no matter where you find a source, this is a good means to go ahead and find the original copy of it. But for the sake of today's example, I was showing you um, how to find an article that we found referenced on Wikipedia. So the second step here is to navigate on over to Google Scholar. Now I will mention the library has a variety of multi-search uh, functionalities built into their research page. That's pretty useful. However, I think that Google Scholar beats those out because it allows you to bring in a wide selection of sources and sometimes can even find stuff that the library doesn't have. So let's talk about how to use Google Scholar. The first thing that you want to do is you want to link Google Scholar to the, Chico, the set of Chico resources that are paid for with your student fees. So to set this up, um, go ahead and click on the top. And I will mention that often if you're accessing the internet on campus um, or with the VPN on campus, this is already pre-set up. But if you're off campus, um, this is how you do it, and it's a good idea to check it anyways. So go ahead and on the upper right-hand corner, there should be that link that says Scholar Preferences. Click on it, and it'll bring up a window. About halfway down the window, you'll see a spot that looks like this. It says Library Links, and there's a little search bar there. It says Find Library. Go ahead and just type in Chico, click Find, and the Find It at Chico option will show up. Check the box next to it, scroll down to the bottom, click Save, and then navigate back on over to scholar.google.com. What this has done is it is um, set up the library link to the Find It at Chico service, which is um, part of a greater service called SFX that we'll get to in just a second. Now at this point, you want to try to find that article you were looking for. So I went to a Wikipedia page on immigration, and I found a journal article that was published in the Journal of Criminal Law and Criminology in 2004. However, there was no direct link to it, just the name of the citation. So I want to find that original journal article. So I copy the title of the article, and I paste it into Google Scholar, and click Search, and bingo. First thing that pops up is the article I'm looking for. So if you'll notice, over here on the side, we now have this Find It at Chico link. If you go ahead and click on that, what will happen next is it will bring you to the SFX page. Now, as previously mentioned, SFX is a service paid for by the California State University System. And what it's used for is tracking down um, sources from the different uh, variety of databases and libraries that are available to you. Now, with journal articles, most of the time, if it's somewhat recent or you know, even if it's not, the library will have access to some full text. And full text is great because that means it's usually a PDF or a web page and you can download the full text on your computer and never have to leave the comfort of your laptop. However, sometimes there is no full text available and you have a couple of options. 
first you can go ahead and check uh, Merriam Library catalogs and there will be a link for that and you can see if the library has a hard copy of it and if that's the case go to the library grab the hard copy and you're golden however if the there is no full text available and the library doesn't have it then you can use what's called interlibrary loan and interlibrary loan is an amazing service that um, can actually send out a request to a bunch of different libraries all over the United States and sometimes even internationally and can track down almost anything um, and it's all free for the most part. I think there's only been two times in the hundreds of things that I've gone through interlibrary loan for where I had to pay a small fee to get um, some really odd sources like a, a master's thesis from the University of Florida and stuff like that. But for the most part all free and they'll mail it to you and you'll get it within a couple of days. Amazing service. Use it a lot because it's great. But as in this case the full text is available so let's talk more about that. So at this point go ahead and click on that full text is available link and it'll bring up the database entry. Now a lot of the stuff that it pulls up tends to be in some version of EBSCOhost since most of the databases that the school pays for are run through EBSCOhost. At this point, it's a good time to go ahead and grab that citation information. So remember, like we talked about earlier, up in the address bar, little journal dot, um, icon, click on it, boom, it sends a tarot. Don't have to worry about that. And then over here on the side, you'll see where it says full text PDF. You can go ahead and click on that, bring up the PDF, save it to your computer, or attach it to Zotero if you want to do it the way that I do it. And boom, you started at Wikipedia, ended up at in a uh, database on the university and you now have your scholarly source source that you should read and incorporate into your speech or academic paper. All right so before we move on to talking a little bit about your outlines I want to briefly go over the library research assignment. So next week you'll need to turn in the library research assignment which means that you need to pack yourself up head on over to the library and knock this thing out. First off, let's talk about what the heck the point is of this assignment. Well, basically, the idea behind this assignment is to get you to go to the library and learn how to use it. Also, it's worth 30 points, so it's probably a good idea to do it. Uh, to find the library or research assignment, you should go ahead and log on to our Vista page, and there's a couple of things that you need to grab. First off, on the main page, there's a link that will take you to the instruction sheet for the library research assignment. A little screenshot of that right here. And then the second thing that you need is the worksheet located in the templates folder. A worksheet is a uh, Word document that has places for you to type in all the different things that the library research assignment will have you do. And when you're finished, it, finished with it, you should go ahead and turn it into a PDF and upload it to the Dropbox and I will grade it and things will be good. I'm not going to go over this uh, any more than that because the instructions on the website are pretty explicit and if you follow them exactly you should be golden and things will be good and you'll have a better idea of how to use the library and theoretically will gain three more sources that you can use in your speech. So get it done and get it uploaded. Do next week. All right. The final major thing that I wanted to talk about today were your outlines. For those of you who were in class on Wednesday, we went over some examples, talked about uh, some things that were done incorrectly, uh, both in this class and in the past, and I'm just going to kind of re-go over some of that today and give you a few tips. Uh, first thing, academic honesty. I don't know that if you guys have caught on yet, but the Dropbox tool that we use on Vista uh, is called Turnitin, and it is also a plagiarism checker. So we'll go ahead and uh, not mention whose paper this was. Um, most of the ones that were uploaded uh, as drafts had large chunk of plagiarism in it. But what the program does is it goes out and it queries a deep search of the web, academic journal articles, books, and every paper that has ever been submitted to the program across the United States and the world and sees if you have um, plagiarized from any of those sources. Even if you change a word here or a word there, it has pattern recognition and it will still catch you. Now, for the draft assignment, I'm not worried about this. This was a learning experience, it's a chance for you guys to uh, 
not do this in the future. However, um, bound by policies of a department in the university, if someone were to submit this outline as their final outline for their speech and it had big chunks of plagiarized content copied and pasted off of a site like this, uh, the consequences are pretty harsh. First of all, I'm required to flunk you both in the paper and in the speech uh, and possibly even the course after a, a meeting took place and required to turn you over to student judicial affairs where you could possibly even be expelled. Um, it's really harsh, but the school has a zero tolerance policy on plagiarism and that would be absolutely devastating to your academic career and I don't want to do it. I know you don't want to have this happen. So in the future, please make sure that you don't just copy and paste chunks of your speech from a website into your uh, into your outlines because the program does catch you and then we have a problem. But what you can do is use this as learning experience and even use the tool to help you make sure that you're being ac um, honest in the work that you do. If you submit your outlines ahead of schedule, you can actually view the reports and make sure that things aren't plagiarized. And if things are, make sure you go back and cite them and paraphrase them in your own words. Um, and you can do this once every 24 hours up until the paper is due. So, for example, if you're one of the 12 people giving your informative speech next Wednesday, you could turn a draft of your outline in today and the next day and the next day all the way up until Wednesday um, at 7 o'clock when class is due. So that gives you a chance to turn in multiple times leading up to an assignment to make sure that you don't have any problems with it um, as far as plagiarism goes. And you can just re-upload, it replaces it, and there's no big deal at that point. So uh, use it as a tool and as a learning experience, and I really don't think that we should have any problems. All right. The next thing that I noticed to be a big problem looking over your outline drafts was, for the most part, the complete lack of APA formatting and APA references. So amongst those were very few people that actually did their in-text citations right. So on another note related to academic honesty, if you put information in your speech or in your paper and you don't cite it, then you're committing plagiarism and you're creating academic honesty. So when you give your speech, you need to make sure that you cite all sources verbally. And when you write your outline, you need to make sure that you cite all sources in the text using in-text citations. So let's quickly go over how you do that. So and this is, should all be reviewed from the informative lecture. Most of the time, if you have a good quality source out of a journal article or, or a book, the way in-text citations work are pretty simple. You add a parenthesis, give the author's last name, comma, and the year of publication, close parenthesis, and throw a period on there, and life is grand. However, sometimes you may find a source that you're using that is missing some information. For example, if it's missing the date, then you use the N period D period for no date, and that's fine. But do do a bit of digging around, because sometimes you can actually find the date if you just put a little work towards it. and uh, I'll definitely be checking for that. Rarely, and I stress rarely, you will have some need in your paper to include a website that has no author and no date. Hint, this probably means that this is one of those red quality websites that you shouldn't use. Um, t I'm guaranteeing whatever it is, there's probably somewhere out there that you can find a better source that will ultimately do this better, so you should go look for one of those, but if for some unknown reason you need to include a site like that, then this is how you do it. The website, or excuse me, the web page title, not necessarily the site, um, in quotation marks, and then again, the ND for no date. Uh, a couple other things that you can do is you can include the author's name in the narrative. So if you were citing my thesis, you would say guy, and then in parentheses, the year of publication, which is going to be 2011, close paren, found that, blah, 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 blah. That's acceptable too. And then one last note, if you find yourself um, needing to directly quote someone, then you need to use page numbers. So for example, here I have uh, one of the first lines from A Tale of Two Cities. It was the worst of times. And 
as you can see, we've got Dickens, comma, published in 1863, comma, page uh, P period one, because it was found on the first page. Uh, only need to do page numbers when including direct quotes from a source. Otherwise, you're just really shooting for author and year. All right, so that concludes the big chunk of a research lecture. However, there's a couple of quick announcements that I want to make before we close. First off, if you hadn't already seen it in the email, informative speeches start on February 23rd. Um, these are the speaking orders for our two speaking days, and I think that we should be able to get through everybody in two days. Um, you can go ahead and make note of this and make sure you're ready. Um, and remember, this uh, information is also found on Vista. All right, next time, if you're one of the 12 speak people speaking at the next class period, make sure that you suit up um, and dress in your business attire. I will be grading stricter and stricter on attire as the semester goes on. So take comments you got last time, uh, you know, maybe pick up a little polish and make sure the shoes are nice and shiny and that uh, your slacks have a nice crease in them or whatever <laughs> and uh, look slick. Uh, we're going to be doing informative speeches and remember you do have to have a Google Docs presentation. If you come in and try to open a PowerPoint presentation I'm going to be very very displeased and I will be taking massive points away because you didn't follow directions. And last remember that on the day of your speech you need to open up, excuse me upload that final draft of your outline to Vista. So use the template, fill it in, make sure your sources and things are all good to go turn them into a PDF, go to the Dropbox, find the colored one called Informative Outline, and click on it, follow the directions, and upload your file, and we should be good. So, just uh, taking a peek as things move towards the future. The next couple classes, we're going to be doing informative speeches. Then I'll give you guys a little bit of information on the persuasive speech assignment before we take off for break, so you can start working on that. The persuasive takes a significant amount of research, which is why we get started on it so early. Um, then you'll be gone for spring break, come back for some tactics to make your persuasives better, and then we move into the midterm. So I like to mention this early on in the semester. It's a good idea to start getting yourself prepared for the midterm now. This means taking notes from the weekly readings, jotting down questions that uh, were off those quiz questions, and starting to put together kind of a preliminary study guide. The midterm in this class is pretty difficult, and in the past it has been a large chunk of point loss for students. So one of the best things that you can do is to start preparing now, and keep preparing and just put a little bit of time every week. That way, when the midterm comes up, uh, you won't have to cram and be unhappy with your score. So I hope you guys all have a great weekend, and I will see you in class next week.